Before we get started, if you haven't seen my previous video talking about the transmission audio of the crash, that one lays out the full timeline of the radio calls and the moment this flight crossed the point of commitment. The link is in the description and it'll help put everything we're about to talk about into context. Now, in this video, we're going deeper, but not into what failed and not into guessing causes. Instead, we're going to talk about why this audio sounds the way it does. Because here's the thing, this radio transmission was never meant to explain a problem. It wasn't meant to diagnose anything. It was meant to do one very specific job, keep other airplanes out of the way. And once you understand that, a lot of the confusion around this audio starts to disappear. This is William, and welcome to Black Box Analyst. Before we go any further, I want to correct something from the previous video. I referred to this recording as ATC audio. That wasn't precise. What we're actually listening to is Unicom radio traffic, a non-ATC advisory frequency used at an uncontrolled airport. And that distinction is not a technical footnote. It fundamentally changes how this audio should be understood. At an uncontrolled field, there is no air traffic controller. There is no operational authority. And there is no one whose job is to manage emergencies, ask clarifying questions, or coordinate a response. Unicom is not air traffic control in a reduced form. It is a different system with a different purpose. The design logic of Unicom is simple. Pilots are responsible for their own separation, and the radio exists only to support situational awareness, not decision making. That's why Unicom transmissions are broadcasts, not conversations. When a pilot keys the mic on Unicom, they are not speaking to someone. They are speaking into the environment, to any aircraft that might be listening. No one is expected to reply. No one is expected to ask questions. And no one is expected to do anything except adjust their own behavior. So the content of a Unicom call is intentionally narrow. It answers three questions, and only three. Where am I? What am I about to do? Do you need to stay clear? That's it. This is why the language sounds vague, because precision is not the goal here. On ATC frequencies, precision matters because someone is actively managing the system. On Unicom, precision beyond intent does not add safety. It adds workload. You don't need to explain what's wrong. You don't need to classify the failure. You don't need to quantify severity. All of that information is irrelevant to other pilots trying to avoid a conflict. So when you hear a pilot say, we've got issues, that is not evasive language in this context. It is complete communication. That single phrase accomplishes exactly what the system needs. It signals abnormal operations. It discourages departures. It warns inbound traffic to stay clear. It establishes priority without formal declaration. Anything more detailed would not make the runway safer. In fact, adding detail on Unicom can be counterproductive. It takes time, it diverts attention, and it provides information that no one on that frequency is equipped to act on. This is why no one follows up. There's no controller asking. State the nature of your emergency. Say souls on board, confirm fuel remaining. Those questions belong to controlled environments where someone is coordinating resources. On Unicom, once intent is broadcast, the job of the frequency is done. So when the transmission ends and the frequency goes quiet, that silence is not suspicious. It is exactly what the system is designed to produce. Unicom is one-way traffic deconfliction, not two-way emergency management. This is where a lot of analysis goes wrong. People subconsciously listen to this audio as if it were ATC audio and then judge it by ATC standards. But those standards don't apply here. The lack of detail is not avoidance. The lack of urgency language is not denial. And the lack of follow-up is not a failure. This audio was not meant to inform investigators. It was not meant to explain what failed. It was meant to clear the runway and reduce collision risk. And once you view it through that lens, the language stops being vague, it becomes efficient. Now, you'll hear people argue about what exactly was said on the radio. Did the pilot say, rough engine? Did they say, some issues? People slow the audio down. They isolate syllables. They try to extract certainty from sound quality that simply isn't there. But focusing on that misses the operational reality. Early abnormal situations almost never present themselves with clean labels. In the real world, 
systems rarely fail in a way that lines up neatly with a checklist title. What crews experience first are symptoms, not diagnoses. Instruments may disagree. Indications may fluctuate. One parameter might spike, then settle. Another might lag or contradict it. That creates a phase where the airplane is still flyable, but no longer trustworthy. And during that phase, crews don't speak in conclusions, they speak in descriptions, roughness, vibration, power that isn't responding the way it should. Something that feels off, that's not confusion. That's situational assessment. Labeling something as an engine failure carries procedural consequences. It commits you to assumptions about what is and isn't available. And until that certainty exists, experienced crews often avoid that label deliberately. Not because they don't know what they're doing, but because they're protecting flexibility. This is where hindsight becomes dangerous. We know the outcome, so there's a temptation to project certainty backward, to assume the crew must have known exactly what was wrong early on. But the audio doesn't support that. What it reflects is incomplete information, not incompetence. And that matters because decisions were being made while the picture was still forming. The crew didn't wait for perfect clarity before acting. They acted to reduce exposure while uncertainty still existed. That's normal. That's human. And that's how real-world decision-making under time pressure works. Commitment occurred before diagnosis was complete, and the radio language reflects that reality. Now, let's talk about something the audio doesn't say, but the flight path does. Because beyond language and interpretation, there's something far less negotiable at work here. Physics, specifically configuration, geometry, and energy management. A tight pattern fundamentally changes the risk profile of a flight. When you fly a wide pattern, you have buffers. You have time to evaluate, you have room to stabilize. A tight pattern removes all three at once. Lateral space shrinks, which limits maneuvering options. Time compresses, which limits diagnosis. And options disappear together instead of sequentially. There's no room to stretch things out. No room to trade altitude for speed later. No room to wait and see how the airplane behaves. Now add early descent and landing configuration. Once the aircraft is descending and configured, altitude stops being a reserve. It becomes a countdown timer. Every second, the margin shrinks. Every added drag penalty matters more. Every power fluctuation has a greater effect. And this is where turns become especially dangerous. When an aircraft turns, load factor increases. As load factor increases, stall speed increases. And that reduces margin at exactly the moment drag is highest. Gear down, flaps extended, low energy, tight turn, that combination doesn't announce itself dramatically. It doesn't trigger an obvious failure mode. It quietly erodes margin. This is also where the idea of just go around fades away. A go around assumes excess thrust and excess energy. But in this geometry, those assumptions may no longer be valid. And that realization doesn't come with an alarm. Options don't vanish suddenly, they disappear gradually. Until one moment, they're simply gone. That's why this accident isn't about choosing the wrong runway. It's about crossing a point where geometry stopped forgiving uncertainty. Once that point is crossed, runway choice stops being strategy and becomes reachability. And that is a fundamentally different problem. At the end of the day, this isn't about blame. It's about understanding how normal decisions made under uncertainty can narrow options faster than anyone realizes. Vague language, ambiguous symptoms, tight geometry, none of those things are dramatic on their own, but together they shape outcomes. And that's why the most important moments in this accident didn't sound dramatic at all. Thanks for watching. Fly safe.